Uh, thanks very much to 47 Degrees and all the organizers. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, first, I want to let you know the slides for this talk are available. You can uh, either search for my academic homepage, and then it's uh, lambda.pdf, or I tweeted them out last night. So if you'd like to follow along that way, you're very welcome. Um, so I should confess that this is going to be a math talk, because I'm a mathematician and I feel very uncomfortable if I say things that I'm not 100% certain are true. So I apologize about that, but I'm not going to um, attempt to discuss anything to do with my own research, which is in higher dimensional category theory and more recently in homotopy type theory. So if you want to talk about that, please come find me sometime today. Um, instead, I'm going to tell you a story that I, I really like, though I had nothing to do with it myself. Um, this uh, goes back to PhD thesis of Eugenio Mogi, and then follow-up work by Gordon Plotkin, John Power, Martin Hyland, and many, many others. And this is uh, telling the story of the interaction between category theory and computational effects. And um, two-thirds of this talk is directed at people who have never heard this story before, or have heard of it vaguely, but don't feel like they understand any of the details, uh, whilst the other two-thirds are directed at people who feel like they know this story very well, because there's going to be a twist at the end that I think is less, uh, less well understood. And I, I realize two-thirds and two-thirds don't add to one. That, that was a deliberate uh, calculation. So let me start by giving a preview. Um, so throughout the talk, I'm going to use the letter T to denote some sort of computational effect. So you should think of something like lists. Uh, so uh, this is a, a computational effect that would take a, a set or a type and return the type whose terms are lists of elements, finite lists of elements in that type. Or the computational effect would be something like maybe, uh, which um, has the action on a set of returning those elements or perhaps some sort of failure of computation. So T will be something like that. Then following terminology of Mogi, I'm going to refer to a T program, this is Mogi's terminology, as a function from A to T of B. So this is a function that takes as inputs the values of type A and as inputs values of type T of B. So perhaps lists of B or uh, and might return a value of type B in the case of the uh, maybe. Now, the first main slogan is that the computational effect T is a monad just when these T programs, as we've just defined, these functions uh, form a structure called a category. And if you have no idea what a category is, don't worry, we're going to discuss that as well. But the second part of this talk is going to be taking a different view on these monads that turn computational effects into categories. So if we restrict our attention to these T programs between finite types, or uh, sort of designated finite sets, uh, they give us something that's called a Levere theory. And this Levere theory gives us an interesting perspective on the monad or on the computational effect. It, we can think of a Levere theory as encoding the operations and the equations for the computational effect. There's a little tiny footnote that we'll discuss later on, which is that uh, the computational effect needs to be finite here, or needs to be uh, determined by values on finite sets for it to recover as kind of exactly the same effect that we started with. But most of the computational effects you're familiar with uh, do have that property. OK, so this is a preview. Uh, I'm going to say all of this again. Um, but here's the, the overall structure of the talk. So I'll start by discussing functions, composition of functions, and categories. What is a category in particular? Uh, then um, we'll introduce the sort of first main theme, which are these categories for computational effects, these categories whose arrows or morphisms are these T programs. Uh, we'll then take a different point of view on these monadic computational effects by discussing uh, their presentation by operations and equations. This is the Levere theory perspective. And finally, I'll compare Levere theories versus monads as two categorical points of view that one can take on computational effects. And I'd like to invite questions along the way. Uh, so Carlos is running around with a microphone. If you want to just shout at me, I'll uh, repeat your question back to the audience and then do my best to answer it. So please feel free to interrupt me. OK. So let's go ahead and begin. So a function is often presented as just some sort of formula, f of x equals x squared minus x. But uh, that's not really well typed. So if we're going to define a function more formally, the way that a mathematician prefers to think of a function, is it should really come with a specified set of inputs and a specified set of potential outputs, so possible values that the, the function could take. <clears throat> 
So, I mean, part of the reason for this practice is it just uh, it allows us to interpret what's meant by the symbols in the formula. So, x squared minus x could refer to operations on real numbers, or it could refer to operations on square matrices. So part of, the, part of the intent of specifying a set of inputs and a set of outputs is it indicates exactly what uh, these operations, how these operations are meant to be interpreted. But uh, perhaps an even more important point, an even more important reason for specifying the inputs and outputs to give a, the full typing of a function is that it allows us to understand when two functions are composable. So if I have a function from A to B and a function from B to C, well, the fact that the outputs of f are b and the inputs of g are b sort of guarantee precisely that whatever value is produced by the application of the function f, it's something that can be input into the function g. So then I can define a composite function, which I'd write as g composed f, that goes from a to c. So specifying inputs and outputs for a function is, is really important to guarantee that functions that look like they ought to be composable, in fact, are. Okay, and a category is just exactly the sort of structure that uh, describes this al algebra, you might say, I'm using algebra in a very loose way, of composition. So a category, this is, this is a mathematical definition that I'm about to give. Um, to describe a category, to determine a category, what you need to do is firstly specify some collection of objects, which I'm gonna note by letters like A, B, C, capital letters. And then I need some notion of arrows, and each arrow should have a specified source and target among the objects. Just like for functions, we always specify the inputs and the outputs of the function. And then there are two additional structures that a category must have. First, there should be a composition rule that says that if I have any arrow in a category from A to B, and any arrow in the category from B to C, then there exists a specified composite arrow, G composed F, whose source is the object A and whose target is the object C. So that's kind of the first and most important part of a category. And then the second requirement is that each object has something called an identity arrow, uh, which we'll write as ID sub A. This is an arrow from that object to itself. And then the rule is that identity plays like an identity with respect to the composition operation. So when you compose identity arrows with other arrows, you return the other arrow again. And then the final requirement is that this composition is associative. If you're not sure what's meant by associative and unit, all those aren't really going to feature in this talk in any way. So don't, don't worry so much about that. OK. So I don't think I need to uh, persuade an audience of functional programmers that uh, composition is important, <laughs> that, you know, that composition is an interesting structure to axiomatize. But it's not maybe as clear why identity arrows should be part of the definition of a category why you should ask for an identity arrow. Uh, and the, the, the real point for these identity arrows is it allows us to make the following definition. So in any category, you can define the notion of an isomorphism. So an isomorphism is something that would exist between a pair of objects in the category. So in any category, we can say that objects A and B are isomorphic, or that there is an isomorphism between A and B. Just when we have an arrow F that goes from A to B, and we have an arrow G that goes from B to A, with the property that when we compose these arrows, G compose F, and F compose G, I get back the identity at A or at B, respectively. So one role that identity arrows play is they allow me to define isomorphisms. The requirement is that I have an arrow pointing in each direction, and then when I compose the arrows one way around or the other way around, I recover these special identity arrows. And uh, isomorphisms are really kind of a big deal <laughs> because whenever I have two objects that are isomorphic, uh, it turns out that any category theoretic property, any property that you would define in the language of category theory that's true of the object A must necessarily be true of the object B. So there's a sense in which, in fact, the question of how many objects do you have in your category isn't really well defined, because you can take any category and take any object in that category and then throw in an arbitrary number of objects that are isomorphic to it, and it doesn't change the structure of the category in any sort of essential way. Okay. So I wanted to mention a couple examples of categories. These are some very simple examples, but the only ones that will really feature in this talk. 
So firstly, there's a category whose objects are sets. And actually, for the purposes of today, I'd like to pretend that these sets are finite, because it'll allow me to talk about computational effects using fewer words. The, the computational effects I want to introduce can be defined more simply for finite sets. But there's no mathematical reason to restrict to finite sets only. Um, but anyway, you can, there is a category whose objects are sets, finite or not, and whose arrows are the functions between them, as we were discussing previously, functions with a specified set of inputs and a specified set of outputs. Or more generally, there's something called the syntactic category for any programming language, whose objects are the types in that language, and whose functions are then programs who take inputs in one type and outputs in some other type. Um, and these aren't the only categories that are relevant to computer science. There's Omega complete partial orders, which is, uh, if that's your jam, that's, that's a category as well. Um, I should also say that uh, categories don't always have to be as concrete as these examples are. I mean, there's nothing in the language of category theory that requires that the objects are sort of something like sets or types and that the arrows are something like functions. So, for instance, um, one of my favorite categories is defined like this. So, it, its objects are natural numbers, so not, not the set of natural numbers. Each natural number is an object of the category. There's an object one, there's an object two, there's an object three. Um, for this example to work out, uh, we should not include zero as a natural number, but all the positive natural numbers can be interpreted as the objects. And then an arrow in this category from a uh, natural number n to a natural number m is just an m by n matrix of real numbers, if you like. OK, so I said that that's a category. I told you what the objects are. I told you what the arrows are. To complete the definition of the category, I need to explain how arrows can compose, how you can compose an arrow from n to m with an arrow from m to k to get an n arrow from n to k. That's given by the matrix multiplication operation. I need to tell you about identity arrows, but fortunately, we have something called identity matrices. And so the, the point is this kind of mathematical structure, which doesn't feel like a category in quite the same way as the examples we've discussed previously, it is equally well satisfies the axioms. So categories are really very abundant and can play a number of different roles. Um, we're going to use categories in this talk to uh, sort of emphasize the axioms that you would want when composing programs. But um, sort of the precise ontology of the objects and the arrows won't matter too much. So that's not necessarily the thing to worry about. Um, OK, so that's the end of part one, introduction to categories. Any questions before we go on? OK, let's proceed. All right, so now I want to tell you exactly what I mean by computational effect. Um, so a computational effect is going to be some sort of operation that takes in, let's say, a, a set or a finite set and then returns another finite set. So uh, the examples I want you to have in mind are on this list. So one of these computational effects is lists that takes a set x and returns the set whose elements are lists, finite lists of elements in x. Uh, there's the computational effect maybe that takes a set x and returns that set together with a new element that we might interpret as sort of false or failure of composition or this program did not terminate, something like that. Uh, we have a generalization of this idea. This is the computational effect exceptions. So here it's defined with respect to some other finite set E, whose elements are these exceptions. And this computational effect acts by taking your set X and then returning the disjoint union of X and E. So what that means is that the, the values can now be elements of X, but also the elements of the set E of exceptions. So there's something called side effects that takes a set and then returns the set whose elements are functions from your set of states, that's what the interpretation of S is, to uh, S times X. Uh, there's uh, non-deterministic, uh, which is the computational effect that takes a set and then returns the set of non-empty finite subsets of that set. Uh, there's a probabilistic version of this, probabilistic non-determinism, which takes a set and then returns uh, probability distributions on that set. I'd have to define a probability distribution in a more complicated way for non-finite sets, but these are meant to be finitely supported probabilistic distributions. 
And then also there's a continuation. So this would take a set x and with respect to another set r and then return the set of functions from functions from x to r to r. Um, that example I kind of want to keep separate from the others and, a, and a, for a reason I'll discuss at the very end. Okay. So when we refer to a, a, computation, a notion of computation or a computational effect T, so any of these effects that we've just mentioned on this list, so following Mogi's terminology, we're going to say that a T program from A to B is a function whose inputs are the set A and whose outputs are T computations in B, so elements of the set T of B. And the idea is we should think of a T program as some sort of fuzzy or some sort of funnily defined function from A to B. So we're going to use the squiggly arrow notation. The squiggly arrow is meant to suggest that it isn't actually a function from A to B because a T program is really defined to be a function from A to T of B. But we can think of it as some sort of process that starts with an input set A and uh, gives us an output set B. So let's just work through some examples of these T programs. So in the case of list, a list program is a function from A that then returns a finite list of elements of B. A maybe program is a function that uh, takes as input an element of A and then possibly returns an element of B as output or maybe it fails to compute. Uh, for exceptions, we could have a number of also exceptions in a program. For side effects, uh, a, a side effect program takes as input an element of the set A and then also an element of a state space S, and then gives an update to that state space and also an element of B as its output, and so on and so forth. The non-deterministic function takes an element of A as an input and returns a finite set of elements of B as output, so this is a non-deterministic function. It doesn't decide between them. Uh, probabilistic non-determinism is similar, except now there's a probability distribution on the outputs, and uh, continuations we'll talk about at the end. Okay, so recall a T program, whenever I say a T program, what that refers to is it's a function from A to T of B for some sets A and B. And now I want to bring monads into a picture. So monads were really motivated by something we might call the categorical imperative, which says that these programs should form a category. In other words, programs should be composable. Okay. And that's, that's going to be the first slogan. This is meant to be the first takeaway. So a computational effect defines a monad just when its programs, these T programs, so functions from A to T of B, can be given the structure of a category, can be made into a category in a particular way. And we'll refer to this as the category of T programs. OK, so I want to define this category of T programs for you now. So you should fix an example of a computational effect in your mind. Uh, we'll go through some examples right after this. So imagine an example of a computational effect. And we're going to think about the category of T programs. I'm denoting it KL sub T because mathematicians refer to this as something called the Claisley category. OK, so to define a category, well, we need objects. Those are the finite sets. That's not really the issue here. And we need arrows, and we want these arrows to be the T programs. But now we need certain structure on these arrows, and one of these is this requirement of an identity arrow. So in a category, I'm going to need an arrow from A to A, an identity arrow. In this category, that should be a program, so it should be a function from A to T of A, and this is one of the structures in a, in a monad. They have something called pure functions, or I think it's return in Haskell. And what it is, is it's a function from A to T of A, and that will play the role of the identity arrow in this category of programs. So the pure function is not itself an identity function. I mean, A and T of A are different sets. It's not an identity function, but it plays the role of the identity function in the category of T programs. That's kind of one of the first subtleties. And then the main axiom of a category is I need a composition rule. So if I have a T program from A to B, which I'm calling F, and I have a T program from B to C, which I'm calling G, I need to be able to compose these T programs to get a program from A to C. OK, that sounds relatively straightforward. But remember, what's meant by a T program, this F is really a function from A to T of B. And this G is really a function from B to T of C. 
And since T of B and B are different sets, these are not composable functions. The whole idea of composition of functions is I need the outputs to be the same as the inputs, and that's not what I have here. Okay, but this is where the other key feature of monads come in. So with a monad, any T program, like this G from B to T of C, can be extended, so any function from B to T of C can be extended to another function from T of B to T of C via the bind operation. So the way bind is defined in Haskell, it's, it's in a curried form. I think it takes T of B as the first input, and then it takes the function from B to T of C as the second input, and then returns a value in T of C. But I prefer to present it in this form. So the input to the bind operation, the way I think of it as a, the way I like to think of it is it takes as input a T program, so a function from B to T of C, and then gives as output an extended function from T of B to T of C. So I'm writing this with a G upper star. And this is exactly what I need to make a composable, to compose my T programs. So if I started with my T program F from A to T of B, and then I start with my T program G from B to T of C, I use the bind operation to extend that to a function from T of B to T of C. And now as functions, these are composable, just exactly as we had learned previously. So F composed with this extended function gives me then a T program, a function from A to T of C. And that's the way the composition operation works. Okay, this is something called the Claisley composition. And then you can check a category has these axioms of uh, associativity of composition and unitality of composition, and those axioms will then follow from the rules that are relating the re return, the pure functions and the bind operations, which I'm not going to tell you about. Okay, let's see what this looks like in some of the examples. So for the computational effect maybe, we have this category then of maybe programs. So remember this is the effect that takes a set and then adds a disjoint base point, which we interpret as sort of a failure of composition. So a maybe program is then a function from A to B is a function from A that maybe returns a value in type B. Or the way a mathematician would describe this, this is a partially defined function from A to B. Partially defined because for some elements of A, it does return a, a definite value in B, but for other elements of A, it fails to return any value at all. That's the sense it's a partially defined function. So uh, here, these pure functions are just the inclusion of A into the set that's A together with this disjoint point. And the bind operation works as follows. So if I have a function from any arbitrary function from B to C union this uh, base point, this fail, it can extend to a function from B together with the base point to C together with the base point by just defining the value. If it fails in B, then it should also fail in C. And so now uh, the Claisley composite takes a partially defined function, F from A to B, and a partially defined function, G from B to C. And if we interpret this, this uh, Claisley composition operation using the bind, the result is then, it tells us that G composed F is the largest partially defined function from A to C. So whenever my T program F returns a value in B, then that value is plugged into G, and if it returns a value, then that's the value of the composite function. So that's exactly how you would want this composition operation to, do it, to work if you were defining this category in an ad hoc way. Um, but the point is the monad formalism gives you the right answer automatically. Okay, so let's think about the list example. So in this case, a list program is a function that takes an input in type A and returns a finite list of elements of type B. So here the pure functions are the singleton lists. So for any element of A, I can regard it as a list with just a single element. That's a function from A to list of A, and that'll play the role of the identity function in this category of list programs. And then if I had any function, an arbitrary function from B to list in C, I can extend it to a function from lists in B to lists in C by just applying the function G to each element in the list uh, sequentially and then concatenating the results. So that's a way to extend a function from B to lists in C to lists in B to lists in C. And using that extended function, I can now compose T programs. So if I have a function from A to lists in B and a function from B to lists in C, the way I compose them is I use the second function to uh, 
extend to a function from list in B to list in C, and then I just compose those functions. So this has the effect of taking an element of A, using F to form a list of elements in B, then applying G to each element in that list to get a list of lists of elements in C, and then concatenating those lists. That's the effect of the Claisley composition, which again is exactly the way you would want to compose programs, and it's handled uh, very smoothly by the monad formalism. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Hello. Hi. Now, hello. Is there any other way for composing uh, functions with lists apart from flat mapping? Right. So uh, another. So let me. We speak slightly different languages. So let me reinterpret your question in my language. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so a monad is, among other things, a functor. It's an operation that takes uh, sets and returns sets. And you and uh, to extend a functor to a monad is then to to give specifications of this return operation and, or, sorry, this pure operation and this bind operation. And in general, there are different ways to define them. So, so yes, there, there might be other uh, ways to compose list programs. And from my point of view, that would define a different monad structure involving lists. So. Um, right, so these are, uh, I, sh I mean, basically all of the examples I listed are, uh, can be interpreted or can be fully specified in lots of, lots of different ways. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Was there another question? No. Uh. Hi. Okay. Uh, I was wondering with these extensions again, um, is it true that the T of A is always larger than A and that's why you can do it? Or are there any cases when it's not larger? Uh, great question. Uh, so it's not necessarily, the question was, is it true that T of A is always larger than A? Um, and I did certainly suggest that in my language when I talked about using bind to extend a function from B to T of B. Um, so it isn't, it isn't necessarily the case that T of A is larger than A. So there's a, there's a kind of silly computational effect. I don't know if it has a name in your literature, but uh, what it would do is it would take any input set A, and then T of A is always the singleton set. So this kind of destroys all information. So there is a computational effect that takes any input and just always returns the singleton set. Um, in this case, the... The, the computational effect is just very, very destructive, and it doesn't behave like that at all. So, so no, there's not a size requirement. Though I think in practice, uh, they often are larger. Though it, in some categories, it wouldn't make sense to talk about one object being larger or smaller than another object. But, yeah. Um. Uh, hi. Uh, do your, uh, those kinds of categories comprise only one kind of effect? One kind of what? Uh, what kind of, uh, one single kind of effect. Like, uh, I mean, uh, if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a, we have a list effect, so there is only a category for this, this type of effect. Mm -hmm. And for, for example, for the side effect, we have another category. Is it right? Yes, that's correct. So each, uh, each computational effect comes, up, comes together with its own category of programs, uh, this Claisley category or category of 
of programs, and that uniquely determines the computational effect. So if you tweak your computational effect in a little way, in some way, you use a slightly different composition rule, for instance, it'll give you a completely different category of programs. So, yeah. No. Um. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to ask, is there a mathematical formalism that sort of governs this idea of an arrow between A and a T of B, and an arrow between a T of B to a G of C of some kind, that allows for composition between A and this other G of C, if you understand what I mean? Is so, there a mathematical formalism? Yeah. I mean, I'd say it's exactly the monad, or the, sort of the Claisley category construction associated to a monad. Yeah, but in that case, your list would be, so it would be from A to list of B, and from list of B to maybe of C, and then the composition would be from A to maybe of C over list, so... Maybe we should talk about this afterwards, because I'm not sure I understand your meaning. Yeah. All right, let's take one more. Hi. Uh, in your previous slide, uh, you said that the function... Uh, from A to C, was the largest partial function. By why is it partial? Isn't it defined for all of A? Right, so the way, um, so in the category of maybe programs, a maybe program is defined to be a total function uh, from A to the disjoint union of B with this new element, which we interpret as saying that the program fails to return a value. So a mathematician would refer to a total function from A to B union this failure as a partially defined function from A to B. So equally well, we can encode the data as a partially defined function from A to B that takes some values of A to real values of B, and then other values of A, it, it just fails to do anything. So it's a different language to mean exactly the same idea. Great. All right. So now I want to try and introduce this idea of a Levere theory. And the, I, the, I'll go ahead and spoil the punchline. A Levere theory is a completely equivalent way to think about most of these monadic computational effects that you're familiar with. So to talk about Levere theories, I need to fix notation for a set with n elements. So I'm going to refer to those elements as x1, x2, through xn. The syntax here doesn't matter, but I need some syntax to refer to. And uh, let's think now about the arrows from the singleton set to the n element set in the category of list programs. So by definition, an arrow from 1 to n is really a function from the singleton set to the set whose elements are lists of elements in my n element set. But equally well, I could think of a function from a singleton set to another set as just an element of that set, namely the image of this function. Okay, so let's think about an example. So I can form a finite list x3, x5, x2, x5. This is a list whose elements are members of the set of six elements. And I can think of this arrow, this list program, this arrow in the Claisley category, uh, well, as just being given by the data of this list of elements in the set of six elements. And I can think of this as encoding some sort of six-ary operation. Uh, it, it's giving sort of a code or a name for a six-ary operation, which I might think of as taking six elements, uh, forgetting three of them in this case, and then combining the remaining ones in the order that are specified. And that's going to be the first idea of this uh, Levere theory perspective on a monad, is that when I, if I look at the category of programs, for that monad, and then I look at the arrows from 1 to n, I think of these as encoding some sort of n area operations. Okay, so an arrow from 1 to n in the category of programs, we're going to think of as encoding a n area operation in some sense, but a category of programs has this further operation, which is composition, and what composition is going to give us is equations between the operations. So um, let's think about a few examples. So still we're working in the category of list programs. So what these squiggly arrows refer to is it's a function from the domain to lists of elements in the target 
So for instance, uh, there is a list of two elements given by x1, x2. That's the arrow on the upper left. Then there's a list of three elements given by x1, x2, x3. Those are the horizontal arrows. So those are two lists of elements. And then there's an arrow from, there's a pair of arrows from two elements to three elements in this category of list programs. So what an arrow of that form should be is it should be a pair of lists of three elements. And so in the top diagram, uh, we've got the list, which is the singleton list of just the first element. And then we've got the list, which is the, the pair of the last two elements. And if you had paper and a, a bit more time than I'm going to give you, you can work out using the bind operation for list how to compose these arrows. And you'd see that the arrow uh, that's upper left and upper right compose to the arrow at the bottom. So these, these triangles are indicating compositions in the category of list programs. And if we remember that these lists are codes for operations, then we'll see that these compositions encode equations between the operations. So the list x1, x2, x3, we can think of as being some sort of ternary operation that takes three inputs and produces a single output. And to say that that's factors in this way, in this category of list programs, say that that ternary operation is equal to the operation that's built by composing a binary operation that combines x2 and x3, and then takes that result and then applies another binary operation that combines that with x1. So this top diagram, which is some uh, composition relation in the category of list programs, encodes an equation between the corresponding operations. And similarly, in the bottom diagram, we have different, uh, different arrows in the category of list programs that compose to the same arrow. So this is giving me another sort of operation. So um, I've chosen this example to illustrate a particular property that the composition operations that arise from the category of list programs will necessarily be an associative composition operation. And that just follows from the structure of arrows in this category. So what's the summary? If we look at the, these finite sets, these specified finite sets, which have one element or two elements or three elements or n elements in general, and we look at the arrows and the compositions of the arrows in the category of list programs between them, uh, these are going to define something that's referred to as the list theory. These operations and arrows encode some sort of theory. And the intention of having a theory is now we can talk about models. So this is allowing us to move from syntax to semantics. So what a model for a list theory refers to is firstly it's a set A, and then it has a function, an n -ary function, associated to each of these n -ary operations. And these functions then have to satisfy equations that are determined by the compositions in the category of list programs. So for example, uh, for the composition relations that we had seen on the previous slide, we'll have corresponding operations. So the list x1, x2 corresponds to some binary operation from a to the 2 back to a, which I've written as lambda x1, x2. The other list, x2, x1, also co corresponds to a binary operation, lambda x1, x2. And uh, then I'll have this equation between these operations that uh, corresponds exactly to the composition relation in the list theory. And, and this motivates the following construction. So if I have any one of my monadic computational effects, any of the computational effects we listed previously, I can consider the category of T programs between finite sets. So this is exactly the category of T programs we had discussed previously, but now I'm restricting my attention to these finite sets with one element or two elements or three elements and so on. And if I formally turn around the arrows in that category, this is something, a construction called the opposite category. Um, if I reverse these arrows now, they're pointing in the way that the arrows and the, the functions in the model would point. Um, then that's the Le construction of a Lebesgue theory associated to a monad. Okay, I'm not defining what a Lavier theory is for you. If you uh, Google that definition after this talk, you'll see why I didn't define what a Lavier theory is. But the idea of a Lavier theory, again, is it's uh, just given by looking in the category of T programs, restricting attention to the finite sets, and um, all the structures just given there. Okay. Let me put this all together. 
So Levere theories uh, give an alternate way to think about monads. So let's see if we can see this. So a monad is one of these computational effects. It takes a set and then returns uh, a set of T computations associated to that. Uh, following Mogi, we refer to T programs, namely just functions from A to T of B. And uh, the, the intention of having a monad is that it turns T programs into a category. A monad is a computational effect so that T programs define the arrows in a category. So if we restrict to the T programs between finite sets and then formally turn these arrows around, that is, defines the Levere theory that's associated to a monad. But conversely, any Levere theory defines a monad on set. This is through a much more complicated categorical construction that I'm not going to tell you, but it, trust me that it's true. And this leads to the following theorem. So it turns out that the category of Levere theories, if we think of the collection of all possible Levere theories, it's equivalent to the category of monads on set, or really monads with an asterisk. So there's a, there's a condition that the monad has to be finitary, which means that its uh, values on all sets are determined in some uh, um, structured way by the values on finite sets. But modulo that finiteness condition, modulo some sort of technical size condition, uh, monads, which are maybe a more familiar way to think about computational effects, are entirely equivalent to these Levere theories. So um, one way to say this is that these finitary monads and Levere theories describe equivalent categorical encodings of universal algebra. So moreover, these models for the Levere theory are equivalent to the notion of algebras for a monad that some of you might be familiar with. Okay, so the point of this talk is that we've, we've given a complicated definition of this thing called the Levere theory, and then I've said, well, it's just, just actually the same with the monads. So why would you bother with Levere theories? So this is meant to be a, a teaser, uh, hopefully um, motivating some of you to learn a bit more about Levere theories. So these are some technical advantages from the, the point of view of developing the theory of computational effects that Levere theories have over monads. So firstly, um, monads really act on only one category. If you want to move a monad from the category of sets to the category of omega complete partial orders, you kind of have to start from scratch and define it all over again. Uh, whereas the notion of model of a Levere theory uh, can be defined in any category. You don't have to transport the Levere theory around. It's just available to be interpreted in any category with finite products. Um, so that's a key advantage. Um, an even bigger advantage comes if you're trying to combine operations. So if you have two different computational effects and you want to just have both of them at the same time, there's a notion of a sum operation on Levere theories, and this is another thing that's more complicated to do with monads. There's also a notion of tensor product of Levere theories. This is where you have two different sorts of effects and you want them to commute with each other. You want to combine the operations. And uh, also, if you looked at the presentations via Levere theories for some of the computational effects that you're familiar with, exception, side effects, interactive input, output. Uh, these are presented by computational meaning, computationally meaningful operations and equations, whereas sometimes the monad, the endofunctor part, is a little more opaque. So this Levere theory presentation can give you some real information about the computational effect. Okay. So there's one exception to this story, which is that continuations. So uh, continuations is not an instance of a finitary monad, so it's not encoded by any Levere theory. Um, so in the case of a set of two elements, what the continuations does to x is it returns the double power set, the set whose elements are subsets of subsets of elements of, a set of subsets of elements of x. It's not finitary. Um, it does define a l large Levere theory in some sense, but this is specified with a proper class of operations. This is getting into sort of set theoretic technicalities, and it really shouldn't be regarded as something in the same, uh, same framework. So Martin Highland and John Power say it appears that the continuations monad transformer should be seen as something sui generis. So if you've tried to combine continuations with other computational effects, you might have noticed some issues. And they really, there's a theoretical reason underpinning that, which is this does not fit into this Levere theory framework and so cannot be combined so readily with other computational effects. All right. So let's just summarize. I'll wrap this up. So if we have a computational effect, a T program is just a function from A to T computations of elements of B. 
A computational effect is a monad, just when these T programs can be composed, when they admit the structure of a category. T programs between finite types, however, also define something called the Levier theory, which presents the operations and equations for the computational effect. And provided that computational effect was finitary, so as provided we're not talking about continuations, this really does recover the full structure of the monad that we started with. So I'm hoping this talk is a teaser that uh, encourages many of you to learn some more about it. Here are some references, um, and thank you very much. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.